Good morning. Welcome to worship with us here at Emmanuel. Whether you're joining us online or you're here in the sanctuary, we welcome you this morning. Our worship focus for today is all about our identity that we have in Christ Jesus. Because of God's eternal love for us, we are now called children of God. We are truly loved by God. So we gather today as children of God to bring our praise and our worship to our Lord, amen. Would you read the call to worship together with me? Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise, Praise him for, for his, his acts of power. Praise, Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise, Praise him with, with the timbrel and dancing. dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. That's what we're gonna do this morning. We're gonna lift our voice. God, we give you our worship. We give you our full attention today. We praise your name because you alone are worthy. Worship him. Then praise me with the best silence is the enemy. Then praise me with the best conquer so anxiety. So 
riches of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing. Oh, praise Him. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now hear this good news from Philippians. Jesus, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus this song because it says I want to speak the name of Jesus but guess what it's not just a want it's a will we will speak Jesus' name over our lives so church today we're gonna do something unusual for just 10-15 seconds we just say thank you Jesus out loud with your own words say thank you Lord and speak Jesus' name over anything that might be going on in your life come on lift up your voice say thank you Lord I speak your name over my life over sickness over anything that might be going on God your Jesus, your name has power, Lord. We're so grateful for you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand one more time. He's good. Man. Would you please remain standing for the reading of God's word? Today we read from Matthew. Matthew 3, verse, verses 16 and 17 says, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And the voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him, with him I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Man, you may be seated. Happy New Year, church. Welcome to Emmanuel. If I haven't met you, my name is Clark Corver. I'm the teaching pastor here and just excited to be with you today. Uh, the question that we're going to ask you every single week this entire year is, who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? Every podcast you listen to, every meal you have, every relationship, a friendship you partake in is forming you to become somebody. Um, this week, as I was preparing my sermon, I had to go to the office to print it off. And as I was there, one of my children came with me. And uh, one of the things when it comes to like, who are you becoming, at the heart of it really comes down to your identity. It's New Year's, we think about New Year's resolutions, so oftentimes we think about what action steps do I need to take to become the person that I want to be. And uh, I want to backtrack it a little bit before we even get to what we're going to do. And I first want to look at, do you know who you are? Because if you know who you are, then that changes the way you think and live. And if that changes the way you think and live, that changes who you become. And so as I was in my office printing off my sermon, one of my kids was with me and I looked and on my shelf was a book that oftentimes I'll pass out to people when I'm pastorally walking with them and it's encouraging them in their walk. And this is a story called The Velveteen Rabbit. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of this or read this book. I highly recommend you purchase this, whether you're an adult or you have children, um, it's very helpful. The premise of this book is that um, something comes to life when it encounters real love. And it's real love that brings this stuffed animal to life. It actually knows what it's like to be in the world and be part of God's good creation. 
And the same is true for you and me. So I had one of my children read this, and I didn't tell them why I wanted them to read it. But I said, read this, and let's talk about it. And we eventually merged our way to, do you, do you know why mom and dad love you? And I said, well, dad, that, that other book, that old book with the red squirrel. And I said, what is that? She said, you know, just because you're mine. I said, yeah, that's why I love you. I love you because you're my, my little girl. I love you because you're my little boy. The premise of this book, I also highly recommend, is a squirrel with his father jumping around, and the little squirrel asks the dad, Dad, do you love me because I'm really good at finding berries? And the dad's like, no, that's not why I love you. And then the next page, you flip it, do you love me because I'm really good at climbing trees? And the father squirrel's like, no, that's not why I love you. Do you love me because I can make big piles of leaves? And the father's like, that's not why I love you. At the very end of the book, the father lets the little squirrel know, I love you just because you're mine. And so at the heart of Christianity is this gospel of grace. You cannot earn God's love, which also means you cannot unearn it. It's a free gift that when you say, God, I cannot do this myself. I need you. This beautiful relationship with God begins. And so when you go to the scripture reading today, Jesus is about to begin his ministry. He's 30 years old, just a few years younger than me. And this is what we just read. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. The Spirit of God was descending like a dove. That was the Spirit alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love, and with him I am well pleased. Before Jesus did anything, the Father is letting the Son know, I love you, I delight in you, you belong to me. And so as we ask you this question is, who are you going to become? Before you get to, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, one, two, three, you have to receive God's love. That is the beginning spot of Christianity. That is the beginning spot of your relationship with God. You cannot do anything to earn God's love. God simply loves you because you're his. He made you. That was God's motivation for creating. And I want you to pay attention to this too. All of this happens before Jesus does anything. Before he healed anybody. Before he exercised any demons. Before he fed the 5,000. Before he walked on water. Before he resurrected the dead. This happens. The father says, I love you. This is my son. I delight in you. I'm well pleased with you. So the same thing, you know, the velveteen rabbits kind of pointing at, the same thing, the little red squirrels pointing at, the father loves the son and the son receives it. And then from there, Jesus begins his ministry. So before you think about, I'm going to read my Bible every day, I'm not going to curse this year, I'm not going to get drunk, I'm not going to look at things I shouldn't look at, I'm not going to do all these things, you have to stop and just say, I receive your love, God. And then, and then you have something to offer him back. And you have something to offer the world. So if you go to the greatest commandment in the Bible, this is a, a well-memorized scripture. The greatest commandment is found in Matthew 22, and it is this. Love God and love other people. Love your neighbor. Love those people next to you. And so oftentimes, we can read this and think, okay, well then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to help the old lady across the street. And then I'm going to be in this love relationship with God. You've actually already missed it. Like loving God and loving people doesn't bring you into a relationship with God. Look at what 1 John 4, 19 says. There's a little verse that you've got to read. It says this, we love why? Because he first loved you. So if we just think, I'm going to go and do all these things, and then I'm going to have this kumbaya relationship with God. It's like pause, time out, rewind the track, read that verse in the context of the Bible. It's God initiating, God coming to us, God coming down, God first loving us. So your job, when you ask this question, who am I going to become, is first to say, God, I receive your love today. And I'm, I'm going to warn you, it's actually going to be hard for some of you. It, it might actually be kind of tough. Because you're thinking, here's all the reasons why I don't deserve God's love. Da, 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 da. It's like God is going to give you what you need to participate in his ministry, to participate in his world, to participate in his good creation. Now, one of the stories that the Lord lifted for me was when I was a little boy, um, like preschool, f kindergarten, first grade, I would sit in the pews at uh, Calvary Reformed Church where my father pastored. And at, at one point in every service, you have the part where you give your tithes and your offerings. Well, I'm a little guy, 
I'm not making money yet. I'm not big enough to push a lawnmower. I haven't washed and waxed a car yet. You definitely didn't want me babysitting anybody at that time. Like, I had no way of making money. So every time this, this offering basket came by, and I wanted to participate in the service, but I didn't have the means to. But what my parents started to do is my mom would open her purse, or my dad would open his wallet, and they would, they'd slide me a dollar. And the offering plate would come by, and they'd let me know, hey, Clark, my boy, I love you. You're part of this church. You get to participate in what we're doing. So me and my sisters would put a buck in so that we, we could participate because it's our church. We want to belong. This is what we do. And that just felt so good for my little heart to know that I'm contributing to what God is doing, what the church is doing. But here's the deal. I couldn't do it on my own. My parents had to give me something I could not have on my own power so that then I could give it back. And I could be part of the church. I could participate. The same is true in your relationship with God. When it comes to loving God and loving other people, you cannot will yourself to this. You cannot earn it. You cannot perform. You first have to receive God's love. That's why 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Can I get an amen? This is going to be actually a hard message for some of you to receive. And it is a positive one. It's an encouraging one. It's a biblical one. But some of us just want to get to the action, get to going. It's like, no, you got to stop. And receive God's love. Now, this is important that we talk about your identity. Because who you become, your identity, this determines your destiny. As you've heard around here before. Your identity determines your destiny. And why we have to begin with this is because you have somebody who hates you. You have somebody who hates God. You have an enemy, an adversary. And his primary tactic is to come against you and to confuse you and your standing with God, your relationship with him, really especially your identity. Because what happens right after Matthew 3 when Jesus is baptized, what happens next? He goes out into the wilderness. He's led by the Spirit into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights, and he's tempted by the evil one. But have you ever paid attention to what the, t- the evil one tempts Jesus with? Now, this can be preached and taught in many different levels and ways, but on one level, this is what he says, Satan says to Jesus. He says, if you are the son of God, what's he attacking? He's attacking his identity. So if you're the son of God, then you've got to prove this. That's in verse 3. You go to verse 6. He says, well, if you're the son of God, then he misquotes scripture in verse 6. Satan does. So essentially what Satan is saying is essentially do this and then that will prove your identity. That's the same thing Satan tries to get you and I to do. And then when we mess up, he accuses. You can't be a good Christian. Look at what you did. Or look, you can't be a good Christian. Look what's been done to you. Or look at what you're not doing. You've disqualified yourself. It's the same nonsense he was trying to get Jesus with in the wilderness. Trying to prove your identity. But if you go back to the scriptures, it's like, no, no, no. God gives you your identity. He, he's the one that blesses you with this. You and I just have to simply receive it. When it comes to Satan's tactics, look at John 8, verse 44. It says, uh, Jesus is talking to Pharisees and Sadducees and all these people who are trying to convince others that they need to do things to be part of God's family. Jesus says, you belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar. He's a father of lies. So think about this. When Satan comes at you, what part of your being is he attacking? He's not attacking your clavicle or your big toe or your pinky. What's he attacking? Your heart and your mind. He's attacking your identity. He's attacking your thought processes. He's attacking your worldview. If you are, then you need to do X, Y, and Z. And, and you know the, the thing about the best lies is there are elements of truth to them. Because if it's just a stupid lie, no one's going to believe it. But it has elements of truth to it. So when it comes to the Christian walk, yeah, we, there's this sense of we understand that we're guilty before the Lord. And then you come to understand how good God's grace is. This is radical. So you receive this free gift, and it's after that this receiving God's love and loving him back, you do, it changes the way you live. So like 1 Corinthians 15, Paul, Apostle Paul's like, I understand God's grace and because of that, I'm outworking everybody. Does that save him? No. But he's responding to it. James talks about faith and deeds, listening and doing. But what Satan does is he sneaks in and he just slowly flips it. 
goes, you must do X, Y, and Z and do these things to prove that you're part of God's family. It's, it's the opposite of the gospel. God loves you because you're his. God loves the whole world, but when one repents and believes in Jesus, then they become a child of God. There's a distinguishing mark there, too. Uh, this week, we're reading Matthew as a church, if you're doing the, the scripture reading plan. So we read Matthew 3, we read Matthew 4. Well, someone had sent me the podcast, Bobby and I did, and said, hey, this was really helpful. I want you to just watch this two-minute clip of Bobby Jean talking with me in the podcast, talking about what we're saying today. The reason why we know that we know that we know that this is true is because Jesus is a son of man and he is fully man and he's getting baptized and Holy Spirit is now with and upon him. And right after that, he's baptized. The father says that he loves him, that he's pleased with him. We have the dove here. And it's right after that, the very first verse of chapter four, that he goes, that he is led by the spirit. How can we be led by something that's unfamiliar to us? How can mm. we be led? Like, you know what I mean? Like it, it's one of those things where you might be following, but you don't know where they're going. Like if, you know, if you're the caboose of the train and the engine is up here and, and there's no connection between you, well then, you, you know, the engine's way gone and the caboose is in the back. <clears throat> anyway, I was just encouraged in that, that we need to actually have our doing flow from our being. And another just very simple Bible text that connect to, connected to this in my, in my brain was from Galatians 6. And so we talk with our kids a lot about the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians because, 5. Sorry, Galatians Got 5. You. Because we talk with our kids a lot about the fruit of the spirit and mm -hmm. what like, cause it, it's helpful cause you can see this. Um, you can see these attributes, you know, yeah. love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You can see these things, but the goal isn't that we just will ourselves to be loving or that we just, you know, begrudgedly do these things. It's actually in the verses right before the fruit of the spirit that says that we live by the spirit. Mm -hmm. And it's because of those things that we produce this fruit. The fruit is love, joy, peace. So the we got to spend time on the front half of it. We got to spend time on the live with the Spirit, live by the Spirit. And then obviously this is important in Jesus' ministry because before he's doing anything, before he's healed anybody, I mean really that we know, before he's done these things, For sure. he's been with Father God in this intimate way. He's been like Holy Spirit is now on the scene. And so there's this relational aspect. And so she's just saying exactly what the Bible said and what we're talking about today. Jesus' doing flowed from his being. It flowed from his relationship with God. And the same has to be true with us. We receive God's love. We love him back. And then from that place, we have something beautiful to offer the world. If you could grab the handout you were given when you came in, I want to show you something that I, I stumbled across recently. I was reading a book called Atomic Habits. And one of the things in this book that I found so crazy helpful was it was talking about habits and people who want to change in New Year's resolutions. So, hey, it's the first Sunday of the year. I'm sure a handful of you out there made some New Year's resolutions, yeah? You're like, hey, here's what I want to do. Here's who I want to become. Here's what I want to change this year. And what Atomic Habits taught, when they look at thousands and thousands and thousands of points of analytics, data, and research, is how people actually change. And when it comes to New Year's resolutions, here's probably a popular one. I'm going to lose 20 pounds this year. That's my New Year's resolution. That's my goal. They say from there, then people say, I'm going to lose 20 pounds. That's going to change, you know, what I eat. That's going to change when I work out. And then in three weeks, you are not going to your gym anymore. The gym's empty. The New Year's resolution has been broken. It's done. And you're just moving back on to, all right, 2024, whatever. Here we go. And they said that's what it is like for most people because it's a habit-based change. And they said it doesn't work. They said, however, if the mentality of the person switched is instead of a habit-based change, it's an identity-based change, those who keep their New Year's resolutions, it improves drastically. So what happens if someone says, this year, I am going to be a healthy person. I'm a healthy person. Well, if I'm a healthy person, you know, what do healthy people do? Healthy people walk. Healthy people eat a lot of rabbit food like lettuce and carrots and celery and stuff. Healthy people go to the gym. Healthy people go to bed on time. Healthy people drink lots of water. They said when someone takes on that identity, that mentality of now, instead of I'm going to lose 20 pounds to I am a healthy person, boom, the, the results are off the charts. People are sticking to their plans and they're becoming, they're changing uh, drastically. 
Now, I, I thought about this and was like, this is huge when it comes to our relationship with Jesus. Because if you look at your handout, oftentimes we think like the outcome-based habits. If you look at the, the left circle on your paper or look up at the screen, we think step one is I'm going to do good things. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love other people. I'm going to give my money away. I'm not going to look at stuff I shouldn't look at. I'm not going to get drunk on the weekends. I'm not going to curse and swear. I'm not going to gossip. I'm going to do these things. And then if I do these things, the second step is then my life will have meaning because I'm doing good stuff. And then, <laughs> you know what? Woo! I'm going to be a good Christian. Present myself on Sunday, I'll feel good. And then, you know what happened? God will love me. Without realizing it, that's oftentimes the mentality that we take on when we want to change and become somebody in Christ. The problem is, this is exactly what Satan wants you to do. Hey, jump off, Jesus. Turn these stones to bread. Convince me. Prove yourself. It's the opposite of the gospel. Now go to the next slide. Here's identity-based change. It starts with the middle. It starts on the inside. Going, God loves me. And if God loves me, then by golly, I can love God back and love other people. And if I can love God and love other people, and I'm receiving God's love, that brings meaning to my life. And if that's true, then this is going to change my identity. Then it changes the way I think, and it changes the way I live. So if you look at, at the circles there, you see how they're inverted. One starts with, here's what I'm going to do, and then hopefully in time it changes how I think about myself, where I stand with God. Where the Bible teaches us, Jesus teaches us, this is who you are when you repent and believe you're a child of God. You're in Christ. And when you let God love you, 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 you love because God first loved you, 1 John 4, 19. Then you love God back, then you love other people. Your life has meaning, you have purpose, it changes the way you live. It really is a beautiful thing. If you know who you are, it changes the way you think. And if you know who you are and it changes the way you think, you know what's going to happen? It changes the way you live. And in turn, that changes who you become. So when I ask you this question 500 times this year, who are you becoming? It must start with your relationship with Jesus and you receiving his word and his identity that he gives you. So Bobby Jean talked about the caboose and the spirit and the fruit of the spirit, right? Look at what Romans 8 talks about. He says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, they think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death, but... Letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So what I want you to do, you need to run a thought audit. You know what an audit is? An audit is when you look to see if everything is in its proper place, most often your finances. I recently saw two politicians going back and forth, and, and one politician was asking for money. The second, the, the, the politician who had the money said, sure, we'd like to give it to you. You just tell us where the money, money is going and what department needs to go to, and then we'll, we'll figure it out. And the second politician who was asking for the money got mad and walked out. You know, that's a sign of dirty corruption. They're doing an audit. They need to do an audit to figure out where is this going. The same is true with our thoughts. All of a sudden, this comes up into your head. Does it align with God's word? Does it align with his identity for you? Does it align with what God's word has always said? Because if it does, receive it. If it doesn't, then you got to revisit that and figure out, why is this here? And sometimes, as a Christian, we can begin with good thoughts, helpful thoughts, but over time, sometimes our, our thinking can drift, especially if we're not connected to God's word and God's people. And so that requires us not just a, a once-in-a-lifetime audit. You need to audit your thoughts daily. Constantly be aware of, like, where is this coming from? Is this line up with God's word? Does this line up with my identity that God's given me? If it does, you receive it. If you don't, you examine it to figure out why is this here and what's it attached to. Perfect example. Uh, my grandparents did a great job of talking about, like, debt and finances to my dad and my uncles. Like debt, hey boys, it's bad. You don't want debt, avoid this, all right? Here's, you know, if you own a home or you need to buy a car appropriately, that's okay. But everything else, like to save your money, and then once you have the money for it, buy it. If you, otherwise, just wait, be patient. Well, then of course, my, my dad and my uncles got it. 
And they passed it on to us. But what happened is I had this conversation like 30 times with my father before I went to college. So what happened in my heart is money became an idol. Debt was like next to Satan himself in my head and my heart. I was like, I got to kill this stuff. So then when I get married, Bobby Jean gets this. I'm like, hey, every penny we got, whew, going to debt. We're going to eat rice and beans, beans and rice, beans, rice, and tortillas, uh, sausage and eggs, homemade biscuits, beans and rice again with biscuits and tortillas, and we're going to kill our debt. And she's like, who are you? What is going on? And then here's the kicker. I went to pay off the debt the final time, and I was expecting the ceiling to open, the sprinkles to fall down, me to get a trophy, and, and you know what happened? Absolutely nothing. I was like, what time is it? What's for lunch? All right, I got meetings this afternoon, got to go. Nothing happened. I was like, was that worth getting anxious about, angry about, fretting over? No. But it was in my thought process, and what was once a good thing, and it really is a good thing, pay off your debt, uh, became something much bigger than it needed to be in my life. I did not do thought audits over that time, which is how this, this gift of a teaching became something that became unhelpful for me and for my life. Another funny story. We're, I was in seminary, and... Uh, a guy uh, was talking to us about his relationship with his wife and their marriage and how finances, again, were kind of a thing. The same thing. Uh, the, the family had taught them you don't get into debt and handle your money the right way. He's like, but it's become kind of a point of contention, and it's stressful for, for us right now. And so we walk into this gas station. He buys a 97-cent thing of David sunflower seeds. We walk outside. Ring, 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 ring. His phone rings. He's like, oh, no. It's my wife. She's like, honey, what'd you just buy from the gas station for 97 cents? And I was like, oh, no. Hit the nail right on the head. And, and I laughed because I, I saw, you know, part of myself in that, where it's like, hey, this good teaching, this good thing became something it wasn't supposed to be. So if you're looking for help and you're in couples, we're actually doing finances in couples to kickstart the year. So talk to me or Christy Palmer. We'd love to have you at couples ministry. But it comes down to this. Are you receiving God's love? Are you loving him back? And is what happening up here aligned with God and his word? Because this is what Philippians 4 tells us. When it comes to your identity and who you're becoming. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Now, can I get a show of hands? Who thinks this is a good idea? We all should be having our hands and feet in the air right now. This is a great idea. Think about these things. The hard part is when you go, Pastor, I am trying to think about good things. I am trying to do uh, positive thinking, and it's just not working. And you know what the problem is? The problem is this thing called the law of exposure. If you read your Bible for five minutes a day, which is a solid, solid start, but you are in the news or on your phone or on the media for an average of three to eight hours a day, which voice is going to be more influential? Whoever you're giving your, more time to, right? That's the law of exposure. The law of exposure teaches us that your mind is like a sponge and it will absorb and, and reflect whatever is coming in uh, primarily. And so if you go back to the, the handout I gave you, I want you to do some homework today. Look at this real quick. There's a big checklist on here. I got this from, I think, Atomic Habits or Winning the War in Your Mind by Craig Groeschel, which is often where those charts came from, by the way. Uh, Atomic Habits and Winning the War in Your Mind. The, the checklist of things we give ourselves to. These are things that are influencing who you're becoming. And huge disclaimer, these things are not necessarily bad. What I want you to do is audit your thought life. Say, how much time am I giving myself to these things? Scrolling through the news on my phone, texting with friends and acquaintances about things that aren't important, watching funny memes to share, listening to podcasts, music, audiobooks. You go through this list, and I want you to actually check the boxes on here and think about it and go, I wonder how many minutes or hours a day am I giving myself to these things? And then I want you to align it and go, well, how, how many minutes am I in the Word? Am I praying? Am I surrounded by Christian community encouraging one another? And then ask yourself, when it comes to Philippians 4, and you're supposed to think about things that are good and noble and true and praiseworthy and heavenly, and if that's hard for you, you think about the law of exposure. You think about who you're becoming. What are you opening your eyes and your 
your ears to. I'm saying something that's a little controversial right now. I know that um, anxiety and depression are a very real thing. And we've said it a hundred times from the pulpit. We bless medicine. We bless counseling. Do it if you need to. I think some of you need that. However, a lot of you are anxious and depressed. And all you need to do is shut your phone off. I'm being dead serious. Turn your phone off. Go a month, not just a day, go a month without looking at the nonsense on your phone. I mean, 24, we start off with a banger here. There's all kinds of crazy stuff happening in the world. So if you're on your phone reading about all kinds of crazy stuff that's happening, people getting in trouble, shootings, war, whatever, you're going to just get consumed by this. But when you go back to God's word and God's identity, that's what Jesus did. If you're the son of God, do this. If you're the son of God, do that. Jesus used the word of God as his sword and, and stake claim around who he was and how he was going to live. And with that, that's where you're going to win the war in your mind. This is when you're going to, again, stand foot and go, this is who I am in Christ. Here's how I'm going to fight this battle. Because look at what 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 5 says. It says, though you're in the world, you're not going to wage the war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish strongholds against every pretension that sets itself up against what? The knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. And so church, it, it took us time to get to where we are in the person that you are today. So I want you to be gracious to yourself. It is going to take time for you to change. The sanctification process is a, it's a lifetime. You become in person A and you become in person Z. You be in that person who is attached and stuck in habitual sin to this saint that's, that's, that's following Jesus Christ. Like, take on your identity in the Lord and walk in it. But it takes time. It takes time. You're not going to read the Bible and just boo, have it all figured out. Nobody does. Life is a marathon, so give yourself grace. But you got to begin with receiving God's love for you. you got to begin by receiving the identity that, that he has for you. So if you go back to that circle, the, the, the helpful circle, you got to begin with this. You repent of your sin and you believe in Jesus. And you know that you're a child of God. Just like we said at Christmas, you're part of God's family. He loves you. And from that, then you have something to offer other people and you have to offer God. And then your life finds meaning. And then it changes the way you think, it changes the way you live. Who you are, your identity, determines who you're going to become. And so my prayer is that as you go through this checklist and you're examining your life and you're auditing your thoughts, you go, okay, wh which voice is more prominent? Which voices have authority in my life? Who am I becoming? Submit yourself to God's word. Join a group. Get plugged in. Come here on Sundays. These things do not save you. But they reinforce this relationship with God who does save you. And here's what's, what's funny. This, this came to my mind. When you begin to know you're loved, you will go great lengths to be around people who make you feel good about yourself. When, think about the people in your life that like you, that love you. Do you reluctantly hang out with these people? <laughs> no. You want to be with them. Because they speak life into you. They encourage you. I, I remember being a little boy... And when I could start working, like second grade, uh, we, li we lived in Southside Des Moines, and we lived at the, the parsonage of Calvary Reformed Church. So this church was like on three or four acres, and they needed someone to cut their grass. So they had this big grasshopper lawnmower. It had like a 65-inch deck. It has these handlebars that come out like this. It's really cool. You just kind of turn them and do donuts and stuff. And uh, my dad was like, hey, my, my son told the consistory, my son will cut the grass. You pay him. Problem was I wasn't heavy enough. So I had to put like six Bibles on the seat and, and ride this thing. If I hit a bump, the kill switch would go off. So I had to go get my dad. Anyways, I would go great lengths to mow this few acres so I could make a, a few dollars so that I could save my money so that I could fly here. So I could be with my grandpa and be with my cousin Curtis and be with Uncle Ken because I loved them and I knew I knew that I knew that I knew that they loved me. And if you've been around my grandpa at all, what would, what would he say? You're my little, you're my little boy. You're my little girl. You're loved. God has good plans for your life. You're special to me. Here's a starburst. So 
when we come to the funeral and people are talking about grandpa, like he always used to call me his little boy. You're like, no, he used to call me his little boy. No, he used to call me. He said that to you too? It's like everybody thought that they were Pastor Harold's little boy, little girl, special to them. Because you were. But, but when you know that you're loved, you want to be around people. And so I think when it comes to your relationship with God, you got to know that he loves you. He delights in you. He might not delight in what you're doing. That's the gift of repentance. You repent, you believe, you come to him, and as you grow in your relationship with him, you're going to want to be with him. And when you know who you are in Christ, that, my friends, will determine who you become. And that's what we're going to talk about the rest of this year. So worship team, as you come on up, here's a couple reflection questions I'd like to give you. The questions are these. Who you are becoming is closely tied to your identity. Before you take action steps, I want you just to take a moment and receive God's love for you. Repent of your sins. Believe in Jesus. As Christians, we continually repent of our sin and receive God's love. This is that thought audit. It's not something you do one time and you're done. You do this many times a day. And it's from this place we love God and others. So, from this place, what's the Lord inviting you to do after today's sermon? Would you take a few minutes and reflect on this?
that we bring to him. Psalm 24 verse one says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, amen. So feel free to give online or through the ERC app or if you brought your offering with you today, you can place it in the basket as it passes your row. Give as the Lord leads you today.
Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for an opportunity to lift up the name of Jesus with our prayers and the singing and the scriptures. I pray, Lord, that your name would be glorified in all of our lives, and I pray, Lord, that we would receive your love. Uh, we love because you first loved us, and then we love you back, and we love the world. And so I pray, Lord, that we'd receive it and have an encounter with you, the living God, today, and uh, our doing would flow from our being with you. We love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 Once again, welcome. We're so glad that you joined us for our worship service today. Uh, I have a few announcements for you. So tomorrow night kicks off Alpha right here. So yes, every Monday night from 6 to 8 p.m., there will be a dinner included, uh, free child care, and this is a safe place to ask your questions about God or the Bible and the church. Um, and we just want to encourage you as well to consider inviting someone and actually going with them to Alpha, walking alongside them in that journey. Um, that's a really powerful way to um, reach someone who has questions and support them in that. And then um, we are a praying church. As always, we will have people that would love to pray with you today right here um, down in front of the stage. Or you can also put your prayer requests in through the ERC app. Thank you, Rachel. Clark shared in his sermon um, about your thinking about the law of exposure. So we're going to have a seminar here uh, next week on spiritual warfare. And, and we've been exposed to things. And uh, the Bible says that if you don't forgive someone, you have anger stay with you, that sometimes you give the devil a foothold in your life. We'd like people to be free. So the seminar is Friday evening, uh, January 12. I think it starts at 6.30, um, but you can look it up. It's all day Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon, and then Sunday, Carl Payne will be preaching. If you go to the next slide, this is the book that many of us read. If you haven't finished it, I hope you'll finish it. He'll be preaching here on Sunday as well. God bless you. All right, church, if you open up your hands, we'll give you a blessing and benediction. As you receive the blessing, I'm praying that you would encounter God's love for you. If you are trying to wrestle with this, and this is new for you, I'd encounter you to go to Alpha, I encourage you to go to Alpha. That's a great place to start asking these questions about Christianity and God's love. I want you to receive that. I want you to experience that. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn the countenance of his face towards you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise.